welcome to this video. It amazes me that so many people keep coming back to watch these videos, so it's absolutely brilliant. And for someone like me who trained in the old days and started teaching and practicing in the old days, the idea that you can speak to so many people, the novelty just never wears off. So, but I do appreciate you coming back. Now, two things I want to do today, um, and I'll tell you briefly just in case you don't want to listen because it's not for everyone. The first one, if I dare mention the word again, is hydroxychloroquine. I know some of you probably turned off already, but stick with it. It is quite interesting. Because when I did that, uh, that video the other day on hydroxychloroquine on, in ill people, I get tiraded with emails from the hydroxychloroquine believers. It's almost become an article of faith, this. That, ooh, um, they gave it too late. If you'd given it earlier in the illness or if you'd given it prophylactically, it would have been completely different. Well, I'm going to give convincing evidence today that giving it prophylactically has no difference, makes no difference at all. No difference at all. Either way, for, from a very large sample size. So I'm going to do that. that, that this, this paper here, the effects of uh, hydroxychloroquine, so I've prepped that. But then when I was doing this, it said it's got data from the Open Safely platform. The Open Safely platform. Now, I've never heard of this Open Safety uh, platform. And I've been studying research for a long, long time now. Never heard of it. <clears throat> and it turns out it's only been going for five weeks. So it, it's, of, it's going to be of an immense importance. Now, this has come out of this pandemic. Let me just show you this briefly here. Um, so it started, it's called Open Safely. And this is Oxford University Primary Health Sciences, NHS data people, this TTP, their data people as well, the TPP rather, doesn't seem to stand for anything. And of course, the London School of Medicine, uh, Hygiene and Tropical, uh, Tropical Medicine. So Oxford University, Tropical Medicine people, all very, uh, very reputable stuff. So that's their kind of uh, joint logo there. Now, it turns out that this setup only started about five weeks ago. That's why I hadn't heard of it. And it's come out of the, the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And it seems to me that if this carries on, um, this is just something immensely beneficial that's come out of this pandemic. Now, let me go on and, and tell you about it. Now, what's happened traditionally in, in research projects is that someone said, well, I think I'll do a research project on something or other. And they'll work really hard for a couple of years and they'll get together a few hundred or if it's a multi-centre project, a few thousand patients and... Um, study that and, and, and try and get information from that. That's the way things have happened traditionally. This turns that on its head and it, it's of immense import. Now, what, what, what this is, it's a, it's a new secure analytical platform. It's a computerized analytical platform. So it's all this information's there and uh, you can crunch it with all sorts of clever statistical packages that you and I don't understand. And it's based on the electronic health records from the National Health Service so far in, in England. So basically all the electronic records from the NHS in England are now on this single database. Or many of them are, not, not all of them yet. Now this is remarkable progress because there's been complete, well it's a complete dog's dinner. The NHS computer system wasted about £11 billion a few years ago, never, never worked. But things seem to be evolving now, so they are working, but that's a separate story. Anyway, th this database, this Open Safely, created to deliver urgent results during the COVID-19 emergency. So it, it, is, it, is, it, it came about because of the COVID-19 emergency that we need data. And that's what this channel's always been about. What is the evidence for this? You know, wh wh why are we doing this? H how dare you inflict a treatment on someone if you have no evidence for it? We absolutely have to have rationales for interventions and things that we do. So, so far, they've got data from more than 24 million patients on this, on this database. So they can analyse and do statistics on data from more than 24 million patients already. And they're adding all the other patients in England as well. This is, this is a work in progress. So it's absolutely huge that this data can now be accessed. And, and it's full uh, pseudo... Let me put that word on because I'm not I'm not that familiar with it. <clears throat> su su pseudo pseudo onomized pseudo onomized anyway. You probably read it better than me. I'm a bit dyslexic. Can you see? It? Oh yeah, there we go. Um, pseudo onomized primary care NHS data. Now, what this means pseudo uh, anonymized. What it means is that it's got real patients' data 
you can identify individual patients, but there's no way you can tell who they are without additional information that's stored on a completely separate package. So you have the advantage of being able to tell things about individual patients, what drugs they're on, what their outcomes are, how well they did, how badly they did, uh, what, what seemed to affect them, D down to the individual patient level. But you can't identify who they are. So in other words, insurance companies can't tap into this and say, well, you've got this disease, you're not getting insurance. So, so that has seemed to have been well taken care of. And uh, if, if you read there, if you read their full paper, um, which is just a click away there, um, it, it is quite convincing that they have done a good job of this. Pseudo anonymized, I think, is the what I'm trying to say. Pseudo anonymized. <laughs> Don't know about you. I sometimes have trouble with words. Um, more patients coming on after over the 24 million uh, shortly. And this database is now open for secure reviews to analyse the NHS data. It's open for scientific reviews and uh, it's in a secure environment and it's used by uh, vetted trusted analysts who can actually go in and interrogate this data huge scale computation this is an example of what we call a big data isn't it this is this is big big data basically it's going to be everyone in the nhs basically isn't it and, and as well as that, another big advantage of this is it's near real time. So as the computer systems are updated, new evidence can come. So we can, we can work out how effective it is to give um, dexamethasone in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome and, and virtually learn on a day by day basis. It really is a, a complete game changer for, for adjudication of efficacy of treatments, for example. So they've only been doing it for five weeks. It's more accurate than any uh, other analysis by an order of magnitude. I mean, that, that's what they say. Let me put that on. That's just mind blowing. Um, more accurate than any previous analysis by an order of magnitude. It's 10 times more accurate than anything we've used previously. I mean, this is a complete utter game changer in healthcare research. It's just, it's just incredible. Um, England seems to be the only country in the world doing this now. Um, don't know if other European countries have got similar projects. Hopefully Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland will be tagging on. Um, but again, I don't know that yet. But of course, the more numbers we can get, the, 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 the better it is. We always want to take our specific interventions from general principles rather than looking at individual cases and extrapolating from the individual case into the general, which is intrinsically irrational this is this is the way to do it take the big data and that's going to apply to the individual the bigger the numbers the better as we've said repeatedly of course as you all already know so it's big data uh, it also includes primary care data so primary care is like um, you know gps and things like that care in the community is primary care it's got great statistical power um, it's associated with specific medications and medical conditions so we can get that information out um, and it's, it's exactly what we need. Um, it, it's, it's come out in the last few weeks of the pandemic. And they say this can um, save lives by modifying patient clinic, clinical and population behaviour. In other words, if we know what works, we can do it. So that is that. That is the uh, Open Safely new data system. And it really is, it really is quite incredible. I mean, I, I've, I've done research projects and, and you, you kind of, scurrying around trying to recruit patients or recruit people for it and it's really quite difficult to do but here they're all there and the data can be anonymously interrogated and this thing about the hydroxychloroquine is an example of that and and if you just stick, stick with this for the next five five minutes and you'll see how powerful this can be so now this is looking at the effects of pre-exposure hydroxychloroquine in other words people who what happens if you give people hydroxychloroquine and then they're exposed to SARS coronavirus too. No, no, no clinical trial data on that. But it so happens there's many thousands of people in the country who are getting hydroxychloroquine for other medical conditions. How did they do? How did they do when they're exposed to SARS coronavirus too? And uh, as you know from the start of this video, it made no difference at all. But let, let's, let's look at it. So it's effects of pre-exposure. That's prophylactic use of hydroxychloroquine on COVID-19 mortality. So if you give it when patients are feeling well before they're exposed, does it make a difference? 
population-based cohort, and we'll see it's one heck of a big cohort, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis or systemic lupus erythematosus. Systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE. So this, this, is, a, this is a systemic uh, autoimmune reaction. So, so th these are both autoimmune diseases, really. Rheumatoid arthritis, it tends to affect primarily the joints. Well, it does affect the joints. It's an arthritis. It's inflammation of the joints. And, uh, but systemic lupus erythematosus means it's all over the body. It comes from the Latin. Uh, the, the erythematosus means that you get red, typically you get a red butterfly rash on the face. And lupus, um, it's, it's just the way these words come about. Lupus is Latin for wolf. And the wolf roams around the forest and this disease roams around the body. It's just the way these diseases are named, but we're stuck with the name now. If you want to think of a better one and it's internationally accepted, good luck to you. But um, that, that, So systemic lupus erythematosus, it, it's, it's an autoimmune disease that affects different parts of the body at different times with autoimmune reactions. Very, very common in, uh, in Cambodia, actually. When, when I first went to teach in Cambodia, they said, can you do a lesson on SLE? I thought, SLE? Well, you never see it. You know, it's rare in this country. I mean, Cambodia is really common. So people get SLE, uh, carditis, cerebritis. You know, it affects different parts of the, the body. Anyway, I digress. Um, so that's what it's about. So basically, it's people who are on hydroxychloroquine for these other indications where hydroxychloroquine is indicated, where it's the right drug to give. Now, this was published in The Lancet, 5th of November, funded by the Medical Research Council. And it's looking at the hydroxychloroquine and it's pre-exposure as opposed to post-exposure. Now, I think the difference here is fairly obvious. The previous study we looked at, people got sick and then they were given hydroxychloroquine. Here, people are getting hydroxychloroquine. What happens when they get the virus? Does it work as a prophylactic? Remember, the President of the United States took it as a prophylactic <clears throat> for a period of time. Is there any rationale for that? Now, to be fair, at the time, he didn't know. Now we know much more about it. Uh, so, basically, there was um, inhibits entry of severe acute... So, yeah, so th there's, there's evidence from lab studies that, that the virus doesn't get into cells properly. There's in vitro evidence that it might work. But no evidence of reduced mortality when treating patients after they've been exposed to COVID-19, after they've been exposed to the virus. So, the methods, observational population based as we have said and immediately the alarm bells start ringing you think just a minute this isn't a clinical trial which of course it's not but hang on um, approximately 40 percent of the population of England are on this uh, on this data base now they took patients who have been registered with the GP for at least a year who've been on hydroxychloroquine uh, I think the median dose was five doses of hydroxychloroquine um, over the age of 18. So association between ongoing use of hydroxychloroquine before COVID, is that going to work? Does it work as a prophylaxis? Compared with non-users of hydroxychloroquine. So you can see we have two groups here. We have a group that are using, a group that are being given hydroxychloroquine. They're the users and we have the non-users. And how is that affecting the risk of COVID-19 mortality is the question. And these people are already on hydroxychloroquine. Now, the numbers on this database so far, there are 194,000 people with rheumatoid arthritis or SLE on that database. Huge number. And of those, over 30,000 receive two or more prescriptions of hydroxychloroquine. And as, as I say, the median with, I think, was five doses. Uh, no, f five courses, rather. Uh, they actually said five prescriptions, and normally we give prescriptions uh, for a uh, two-month course would be typical. So these patients were on hydroxychloroquine already. Now, the results. Between March the 1st and July the 13th, 2020, in this group of 194,000 people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and SLE, in that group, sadly, 547 of them died that's what the data showed now these are the users of hydroxychloroquine uh, the number of those was 30,569 people using hydroxychloroquine 70 of those died 
sadly. So these were people with SLE and rheumatoid or rheumatoid arthritis who were using hydroxychloroquine, 70 of them died, infection fatality rate 0.23%. 0.23%. Now, people that had SLE or rheumatoid arthritis, so it's good, so we're comparing like with like, uh, there was 164,000 of those, bigger group, and the infection fatality rate in those was 0.22%. So users, 0.23% died when they got COVID-19. Non-hydroxychloroquine users, 0.22% died. And when they did the stats, that's an absolute difference of 0 0.008. In other words, these numbers are essentially identical, uncannily the same. But they went on and did more statistics, um, accounting for age, sex, ethnicity, the use of um, other bits and use of some, you know, suppressive drugs which can be given in these conditions, geographical location. No association with COVID-19 mortality was observed, none. The numbers were virtually identical and all that has come as, as the first thing from this uh, uh, open safely study so pretty convincing proof there that in patients with rheumatoid arthritis or systemic lupus erythematosus um, giving hydroxychloroquine does not reduce the mortality from COVID-19 it doesn't reduce it doesn't increase it no difference the null hypothesis is supported. So there you go, um, fascinating way. This data would simply not have been available a few weeks ago. This is impressive. This is impressive. Okay, so that's us for today. Um, plenty of other things we can be thinking about now. Um, so the R value, for example, in England is below one at the moment, according to Tim Spector. Very encouraging very encouraging the case numbers are still quite high but the r value is one we'll be doing more specific news uh, when i've got time to put it together okay thank you for watching this video as always interesting times for new data interesting times